Well, Brandis is sad on it. It's, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's it, honestly, you know, uh, and at least, you know, all he does, you know, in his stupid stream, you know, is this, this speed run, you know, bullshit. You know, it's, honestly, you know, it's, um, quite disturbing, you know, and, 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 and. <laughs> Fifteen plus ten. Let's play. In, okay, he's eighteen hundred, but I definitely don't mind. We have the black pieces. Good luck. E four. All right. Let's play e five as we did in the previous speedrun game, which was the Vienna. I remind you. Uh, in that game, we faced the Vienna, and in this game, we might be facing the Vienna again. And I certainly don't mind that. We can put. There, there we go. We can put my recommendation to the test, F4. This is literally what we faced in the last game. I wonder if he actually saw the YouTube video, but I'm not shying away from this. We're going to go D5. We're going for the main line. Knight takes C4. And I will remind you that there is a fork in the road in this position. The old move is Knight F3. That's what we faced in the last speedrun game. The new move is Queen F3, and this is what we're facing right now. Does anybody know, or can anybody remember what my recommendation was in this position. And there are two or three or even more viable continuations. So I'm not pretending that this is the best line, but I think it's the most practical line. It's easy to learn, and it essentially guarantees an equal endgame. Yeah, the move is knight c6, exactly. The move is knight c6. Bishop b5 is correct. This move contains a lot of venom because knight takes e4 runs into knight d4 intermezzo. I'll show that after the game. But who can tell me what my recommended continuation was here? Bishop b5 is correct. How do we actually get into the end game that I'm mentioning? Yeah, our opponent is booked up, so I'm presuming that our opponent analyzed the end game we're about to get more deeply than I did, and in that case, we're just going to have to improvise. Yeah, knight takes c3. A a6 is bad because white simply takes on c6 and then takes twice on e4 and wins a pawn. The move is knight takes c3, dc, and now a maneuver that is quite common in the Vienna, quite common in the Vienna. We throw in a check on h4, exploiting the drawback of white not having a pawn on f2 because white played f4, and we swing the queen over to e4. We trade queens, and we get this endgame. And listen, I have never analyzed this endgame that deeply. I know for a fact that it's equal. I have run stockfish at a very high depth in this endgame, I know for a fact that the computer basically gives zeros. Uh, it's, but it's dynamic equality. It's, it's not equality because the position is symmetrical. It's not symmetrical. We both have weaknesses on e5 and e4. Usually the pawns are reversed. So it takes a second to adjust your eyes to this position. Normally white's pawn is on e4 and black's pawn is on e5. Here it's the opposite. So that's what makes this position a little bit weird. And we almost have a race of, of who can get to their respective weakness faster. What do we have going for us? Well, what we have going for us is a, not even really a lead in development, but the pawn on e4 is restricting the development of white's knight. It's not allowing knight f3. So of course white can go knight e2, but developing the knight to e2 is a lot less effective here. And from e2, the knight doesn't have that many prospects. The g3 square, which would be perfect for the knight in terms of attacking e4, is already occupied by a pawn. So white is having some problems figuring out a good spot for his knight. Conversely, we also have some issues with our development. And the ball right now is in white's court. And the decision that white has to make straight away is whether they take on c6 here or keep the two bishops on the board. So white can go bishop f4, knight e2, these types of moves. Or white can trade on c6, which has the effect of ruining black's queenside pawn structure, but on the other hand, it gives black the bishop pair, and it gives us a monopoly on the light squares. Why are the light squares important here? Well, hopefully you can see why they're important or how they could be important. Look at all these squares. These squares are easily accessible to our bishop, and they're quite weak. And why are they weak? Because white played this move g3. Uh, we can also entrench our bishop on d5, or after bishop takes c6, b takes c6, we have an additional pathway that has opened up to a6, which can be a pretty enticing square as well. Uh, full disclosure, I don't remember what white's best move is here. I've had this a couple of times in my Blitz games. I do not recall 
what the computer recommendation here is for white. So we're basically on our own. This time, our opponent has gone for the topical line, and he plays bishop to e3. Okay, so that's a pretty sensible developing move. Uh, but the drawback of not taking on c6, what is the drawback of white not taking on c6? Well, we can try to make white regret it. How can we try to make white regret not taking on c6 immediately? We can now play the move bishop d7, not because the pin is so dangerous to our survival, but because now if white takes on c6, we take back, and not only do we have the bishop pair, but also our pawn structure is fully intact, and I think there we could start maybe contending for uh, a tiny, tiny edge, although I still think it's it's probably dead equal after the trade on c6, because we don't have uh, the machinery to attack the e5 knight. The knight isn't integral attacker here and if it's traded it's going to be harder for us to attack the pawn on e5 approaching it with the bishops is quite difficult in a game between two gms this would be mo th this would most likely end in a draw most games like one way or, or the other the position would fizzle out but you know at lower levels there's plenty of life in this position just a comment a couple comments in the youtube channel the last couple of speedrun games have been They've been more positional. We switched this 15 plus 10 time control. And at times I understand that it can be a little bit, maybe boring is the wrong word, but it can be a grind to listen to me explaining, you know, positional subtleties in some end game that is totally devoid of tactics. But I maintain that if you want to build yourself up as a tactical player, you have to take care of the fundamentals. You have to know how to play boring end games. You have to know how to win them um, and how to squeeze advantages out of equal positions, right? You can't always get the types of positions you want to get. So think of it, if you're kind of feeling down that we keep getting these end games, think of it as making an investment into your chess future. Taking care of the fundamentals is going to help you develop your style more effectively, whether you're a tactically or positionally minded player, doesn't matter. It's like eating your veggies. So what is our opponent thinking about? What are we threatening? Well, we're threatening to take the pawn with our knight. We are threatening knight takes e5. My guess is that our opponent is probably unwilling to take on c6. He probably realizes that he should have done so on the previous move if he wants to trade. But obviously, if you're comparing losing the center pawn to trading the bishop for the knight, you should go for the latter. And he does. Bishop takes, bishop takes. And now we still need to complete our development, by which I mean we need to figure out lodging lodging for the king and we need to determine where we want to put this bishop so i think some of you might be quite tempted and i'm not ruling this option out by the way some of you might be tempted by the move g6 fianchettoing the bishop has the obvious benefit of immediately attacking the e5 pawn the drawback of the move g6 is that it's a little slower uh, and it, we might get stuck with our king in the center or white might develop some sort of initiative. So let's try to calculate. If we play g6, what is white likely to do? Well, I think white's probably likely to develop his knight. Let's say g6, knight e2. We fianchetto our bishop to g7, attacking the pawn on e5. And white will probably have to defend that pawn with his bishop. So bishop d4 or bishop f4. But the good thing about bishop d4 is that it closes down the d-file, which means we can then castle queenside if we wanted to. We can also castle kingside. Nothing wrong with that. So let's compare that to bishop e7. Do we prefer spending two tempi and putting the bishop on g7 or spending one tempo and getting our development done? Well, it's, it's a judgment call. It's an intuitive judgment call. I have a preference. I think we should play more ambitiously here. And the reason I think so is because the queens are off the board. The queens are off the board. I don't think our king is in any imminent danger. I don't think there's anything white can really do on the d-file. So quality of development in this particular instance is more important than speed of development. And so let's go for g6. I think this is a more challenging move. Hopefully that logic makes sense to you. We want to go g6, bishop g7, attacking the pawn on e5. An additional subtlety is that moving the bishop immediately, a move like bishop d4 I think might be tempting to a lot of people, is a huge blunder. Notice that our bishop x-rays the rook, and e3 is not only a discovered attack, but it simply traps the rook in the corner if the knight isn't developed first. 
And he does, 92, very good. Okay, we continue with our approach, bishop g7. And we toss the ball back into white's court. White has, in my mind, two obvious candidate moves, bishop f4, bishop d4. Both of them have their pluses and minuses. Important to point out that in response to either of them, e3 already loses its luster. It just turns the pawn into a sitting duck, and it doesn't trap the rook anymore. The rook has the e1 square. So we're going to keep our pawn on e4 firmly. We're going to try to keep it protected by the bishop. All right. So my opponent, by the way, wrote me that he, he's a big fan of the stream, and he's got the stream on mute right now, so no reason to distrust him. Um, bishop f4 versus bishop d4 is what we're, what we're waiting for. Now, if white plays bishop f4, then obviously it would be illegal to castle queenside. We would probably have to either castle kingside. We could also keep our king in the center. But with both of the rooks and two minor pieces still on the board, I would be a little bit hesitant to keep the king in the center. I think the king could end up getting caught in the crossfire. So bishop f4, castle short. The knight is probably going to jump into d4. But when the knight jumps into d4, we can slide our bishop up to d5. Classic idea, right? In moving to d4, white closes off the d-file. What we want to avoid is a trade of the knight for the bishop. The only circumstance under which we would allow this trade is if we would be winning the e5 pawn by force. But allowing this trade without any reason leaves the e4 pawn once again as a sitting duck. So in response to knight d4, we probably want to play bishop d5 or maybe even bishop d7. B con B con asks, is e6 an option here for white? Classic idea, right? You go e6, you sacrifice a pawn in order to permanently... Uh, ruin the integrity of black's kingside pawn structure. Yeah, e6 is definitely possible, but I think we're going to be happy to gobble the pawn up. Yeah, we're going to have doubled e pawns, but a past pa uh, an extra pawn is still an extra pawn, and this is an end game. So, giving pawns up like this in an end game is a very dangerous road to go on. Also, after e6, we should definitely consider f5. As dangerous as that move it looks, it builds up a pawn chain. The pawn on e6 is pretty weak, so. We'll cross that bridge if we get there. Our opponent taking his time. Why is this an endgame? Well, the queens are off the board and two sets of minors are off the board. So I think this is sort of borderline queenless middle game. I think with an additional pair of minors on the board, I would call it an endgame. As it stands, I think it's... Sorry, I would call it a queenless middle game. As it stands, I think we're in endgame territory. Okay, knight d4. That's a big move. I was not expecting that. So what did I say about allowing the trade of knight for bishop? We allow it only in one circumstance. In circumstance being, we pick up the pawn on e5 when we have the option of playing bishop takes e5. Let's calculate. Our opponent clearly has something up his sleeve. Hmm. What could it be? I think I know what it is. So bishop takes e5, I think he wants to take. B takes e6. And probably our opponent is attracted to this move by the fact that, as a bonus, our pawn structure is ruined. But we get a four on two on the other side of the board. So takes, takes, takes. I think he wants to move bishop d4 in that resulting position. So if you're watching this on YouTube and you're losing track, you can set this up on your own board and follow along, or you can wait until after the game and I'll make these moves on the board. So here's what I'm calculating. Bishop takes e5, knight takes c6, bc. Bishop slides up to d4, forcing the bishop trade. We trade. Now, what move should we play in that position? Testing everyone's visualization. After bishop takes d4, rook takes d4, what is black obliged to do? We should go f5. We should go f5 to defend e4. And in that position, I think our opponent wants to double on the d file and try to infiltrate the seventh rank. And I think he believes that offers him sufficient compensation for the pawn. Now, I actually think the compensation there is insufficient, and it's insufficient because we have the possibility of creating connected passers in the center with what technique? Who can tell me how black can make another passed pawn? This is after we take on e5, in addition to the passed e pawn. What technique is available to us later on down the line? Not h5, h4. Yeah, g5, f4. 
So if, he, if the pawn is gone from e5, g5, f5, f4 creates a set of connected and protected passers deep in white's territory. I think that's going to give us enough mobility. Uh, and that's such a huge trump card. I would be happy to give up all of our queenside pawns just for that. Let's take on e5. Let's take on e5. Again, if you didn't follow all of it or if you follow 10% of that, don't panic. That is why we look at the games after they're played so I can make the moves on the board and re-explain the high-level uh, thought processes. But this is just life at this level, right? you got to calculate high-level variations. That's just what you got to do. Okay, knight c6 on the board. We take back. It's important that you don't feel embarrassed if you're not visualizing this. When I was 800, I wouldn't be able to visualize this line either. Just be patient with yourself and, you know, try to extract whatever you can extract during the game. And then, you know, that's why I let people ask questions so that you can get the clarification you need after the game. I was 800 once, believe it or not. I would say this is analysis at the level of maybe 2,000, 2,100. So we're in pretty serious territory. I'm 2,200 plus, And uh, I'm trying to raise my thinking to the level that corresponds with our current rating in the speedrun. That's the entire premise of the speedrun. Anyways, how old was I? <laughs> yeah, maybe. I think I was seven. My first rating was 800, eight, USCF rating was 800, 803. I remember that very clearly. I was 803 after my first tournament. <laughs> Born as a 1600. Yeah, that was my default rating at birth. Yeah, what's funny is after the speedrun, um, maybe we can even put this in the speedrun video. I can actually show you guys. I haven't recorded, and when I'm in San Francisco, I sometimes show you my initial score sheets from my very first games. There is a website that has some of my early games from when I was like a 1,000. Maybe I'll try to find them. But let's get back to the game because we have an important decision to make. Bishop c5 is on the board. So I was wrong. Our opponent does not play bishop d4. He keeps our bishop alive. And instead, the idea of this move is very obvious. It is aimed at preventing us from castling, and we can't castle queenside now because of the rook, can't castle kingside because of bishop c5. So we don't need to panic here, and we certainly don't need to play bishop d6. We, we don't need to castle on the next move. What is mission critical is to ensure that this pawn on e4 is protected. This pawn is what's going to win us the game if we keep it intact. It's what's going to lose us the game if this pawn drops. So to me, the correct move here is basically a no-brainer. We play f5 first order of business to build up the pawn chain and secure our, our loot on e4. Then we think. Now the added uh, benefit of the move f5 is that we have opened up a little pathway for our king. Remember, this is an endgame, so you're under no obligation to castle. King f7, king e6 would be an ideal placement for the king. It's on a light square, it can't be bothered, and it protects the d7 square. The problem is that if we play king f7, we will have to reckon with the check on d7, which is actually not such a dangerous check because the c7 pawn is protected. It's kind of a dead end. We could play king f7, rook d7 check, and still go king e6. And if white goes rook e7 check, we can slide the king over to f6 and ultimately smoke this rook out of there with our own rooks. So that would be one way to continue, but it all depends on what white does here. Another option is, of course, for us to play rook d8. What is the drawback of the move rook d8? Who can tell me? Like, rook d8 would be an ideal move, trading a pair of rooks. With every trade, the value of our pawn majority grows. But what's the problem with rook d8? What's the hole? The hole is that it hangs a7. Why is it important that is a7 an important pawn? It is a very important pawn. We do not, the last thing we want to give white is an outside pass pawn on a2. That is the greatest asset you can have in an endgame like this is an outside passer. So one idea that I'm coming up with is to just play a6, right? Just move the pawn out of the way of the bishop, and then we play rook d8, given to Tempe. So what worries me here is a move like rook d2. That would be a very smart move, because in response to a6, white would double on the d file, and we would, you know, the ship will have sailed. We won't be able to play rook d8. 
Why not a5? The reason is very simple. a5 puts the pawn on a dark square where it can hypothetically be attacked by white's bishop. After a5, white can respond with a4 to fix the pawn on a dark square, and that's going to be a headache that's going to last us the rest of the game. Also, after a5, a4, white has a much easier job creating a passed pawn with b2, b4. Right? You want to make it as difficult as possible. You want to make it impossible for white to create a passer on the queen side. And amazingly, this pawn formation, I've talked about this before, this pawn formation, as ugly as it looks, it actually does an amazing job of holding back white's pawn majority. If we put our pawn on a6, it's like spikes. You know, it's like when vampires were buried. Um, I've made this analogy before. They would, saw this on some History Channel show, they would bury them with spikes around the grave so that when they rose from the grave, they'd get impaled. And these are like the spikes that are preventing white's pawns from progressing past b5, if that makes sense. I don't know why I, that stuck out to me. Yes, uh, spooky concept. But you get what I'm saying, right? These are like the spikes, and I guess white's pawns are like the vampire. Okay, just roll with it. Just roll with it. Yeah, you definitely do that when you want to bury a vampire, says Ursus Polaris. On the daily. Yeah, our opponent is taking his sweet time. King b1. Okay, king b1 is... That's a bad move. I, I really don't understand that move. That gives us a free tempo. It gives us a free tempo. What is the sort of top thing that we want to do with the free tempo? I think we can play either king f7 or a6. I think either of these two moves is, is good. Um, let me think for a second. I think both moves are good. I think both moves are, are perfectly fine. Uh, but let's 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 play a6. Let's play a6. I think given this extra tempo, we can just and 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 by the way, even if we don't end up playing rook d8, a6 is still a good move to play because we just remove the headache of having to constantly worry about the pawn being hanging if we move the rook away from a8 at a later point. Rook d2. Okay, but now this comes a little bit too late because what move can we now get in? What move can we now get in? What was the actual point of a6? White is trying to double rooks, but we beat him to the punch. Rook d8, there it is. Of course, white can still double, but a trade of rooks here is deathly bad for white because one rook is just not going to be able to deal with uh, the, the strain of black's doubled passers. We're just going to trade rooks and then play basically play g5 f4 at the first available opportunity, and we're going to win. Trade. Okay, but if we play g5 prematurely, we run the risk of the pawns becoming a runaway train. So we don't want to play g5 uh, uh, until we're ready to do so. And I think that there's no hurry to play g5. We can always make this move. I think we should begin by um, improving our position. I think we should begin by improving our position. And how do we improve our position? Well, I think king f7 is a very enticing move indeed. I think king f7 is a very enticing move indeed. After king f7, rook d7 check, there's a very important tactical subtlety. We have to avoid playing king e6 in that position. It would be a huge blunder. I'll get to that if it happens. So after rook d7 check, we have to go up to f6. And once the king is up to f6, then we are finally ready to play g5 and f4. Notice how good of a job the bishop is doing covering the c7 pawn and restricting white's rook from accessing the queen side. Yeah, so those of you who are tactically minded, you might spot the trick, rook d7, king e6, rook e7 check, always have to think about tactics, no matter how many pieces are left on the board. Then rook takes e5 check, and bishop d4 skewering the king to the rook. And white is able in that position, final position, to stop the e-pawn with his king. Very good. No, this is completely winning. Th this is a not just an extra pawn, but this is this plan is totally devastating. White's going to end up having to give up an entire bishop to, to deal with the... If that, if he even manages that, which is not a given. Which is not a given. Now, my opponent mentioned that he watches the stream, so I'm going to want to ask him, like, uh, I'm, I'm, 
pretty weirded out about knight d4. Like, why give up a pawn? And my guess is that he thought in this position that, and maybe some of you can give me an insight into, you know, like the 1800 mind. I have a feeling, and we'll talk more about this after the game, that he thought, okay, the king is totally cut off. And these ideas of going around the barriers can be hard to spot. So we'll talk about this in more detail after we finish the technical task. I can't believe it's only been 20 moves. Yeah, this pawn chain you can stare at forever. Yeah, no, this is over. This is over. We're just going to play g5, f4, e3, and we're going to build up a new pawn chain, and we're just going to keep sliding that pawn chain up until we promote bishop e3. Okay, that's actually not a bad move. And it, it does prevent g5. Fortunately, we can play h6 whenever we need to play it. We can play h6 whenever we need to. Notice that rook d7 check. Now we can play king e6. And it simply chases the rook off of the 7th rank. Let's go h6. Let's prepare g5. And let's get down to business. h4 blunders the g3 pawn. So white is powerless against the move g5. Of course, rook f2, white could start with. But then we play king e6. And that is why it's so important to involve our king in any such effort. Okay, let's... Get down to business to defeat the Huns. G5. Why not bishop d6? Because it's unnecessary. We don't need to stop rook d6 7 check. Because we move the king up to e6. And now the rook simply has to leave the 7th rank. And now the key move, right? King e6. This is why we went king f7 here. In order to be able to support the temporarily weak f5 pawn with king e6. That's why it's so important to be patient in the end game. You know what the idea is but you improve your position to the maximum first. How should we proceed? How should we proceed? Just keep it simple. We want to prepare f4. We want to go to the moon, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. Rook, not d8. We can play rook d8. But again, we're focusing on just winning this game as quickly as we can. Rook f8 is on the board. Okay, c3. And, of course, we are ready to play f4 and push our beautiful, connected, past pawns. Gf, gf. Of course, we don't want to take with a bishop here. Although we could. We could take with a bishop and it would still be completely winning. But um, we will instead take with a pawn. Bishop d4. Okay, so in such positions, you don't want to, like, immediately rush to exchange pieces. You want to be very purposeful about exchanging, and you should only exchange if you've calculated until the end. Here, I think the easiest is actually do not play e3 because it blunders bishop takes e3 and suddenly white is back in the game. The rook is undefended. I think the best and most efficient way to win is indeed to take the pawn. Now, should we play f3 or should we play e3? One of these moves is very, very bad. Of course, we should play e3. If you play f3, you create a hole on e3 that white could fill with his king. Now it's going to take us 50 years to get the king out of there. So we play e3 now. Now you might say, but doesn't this create a hole on f3? It does. That hole can be occupied by the rook, but the rook is a much easier piece to smoke out of a particular square. We can use our king for that. King f5 and king e4 is going to end the game. And then if white brings the king up to e2... We can use our rook to then dislodge the king via the g-file. Let's go king f5. I'm anticipating king d1 here. This is a very sort of traditional method. Go king e4. White is going to go king e2. And then we use the open files as an avenue. We get the rook to g2, and that ends the game. That's the straw that breaks white's resistance. Yeah, so notice that rook, rook b8 here is inferior. Rook b8 runs into b3, so we literally have only one file that we can do this through. We do it through the g file. Rook g8 and rook g2. White has to move his rook, their rook. Then we go rook g3, uh, rook g2, and we push the pawn to f3. If you want to be fancy here, we can start with f3. Let's be fancy. Start with f3. Rook takes f3 and rook g2 check. Forcing the king back, we win the rook, we win the game. GG. Let's take a look. Yeah, so again, you might look at this and say, well, that was kind of disappointing. There were no tactics. It wasn't that interesting a game, let's be real. But not interesting and not instructive are two completely different things. 
if you're 21 to, if you want to get to the level of you know 2000 2100 standard you have to be comfortable winning games like this you know just squeezing out a equal end game exploiting a mistake and then pouncing in uncompromising fashion so let's go over it quickly all right so i know and our opponent told me that this is all in levy's course levy of course analyzes knight c6 i remind you that knight takes c4 is a very common trap. Black has knight d4, and white is already in huge trouble. Because if you try to cling to the pawn, if you try to cling to the pawn, then black plays bishop f5 with a devastating attack on c2. GG. And I'm going to be asking you some questions. Shah Chichiel, maybe? Conrad. Excellent. Queen h4 check, g3, queen e4, takes take. So I assume bishop e3 is in Levy's course as well. I see that it is the top engine move. Bishop d7. And here you correctly took on c6, of course. You certainly don't want to give up the pawn on e5. The trap that I outlined uh, in the last video, if white plays bishop f4, bishop d7, and then says, okay, we're safe, the pawn is protected, uh, you're running into these ideas like knight takes e5. Maybe not immediately, not here. But after a preliminary castle queen side, knight takes e5 is still a threat because of the, the classic motif. So bishop e3, bishop d7 trade, I think, is totally fine. Castles, and we go g6 here. Hopefully the logic uh, of why we chose to develop the bishop here makes sense. Knight e2, bishop g7, knight e4. Okay, so knight e4 is actually very, very interesting. I think that the key mistake was not knight d4. I think after bishop d4, white should probably have enough counterplay to make a draw, but it is incredibly difficult uh, to handle these types of positions. We'll get to that in a moment. We'll get to that in a moment. I think the simplest, Conrad, would have been to play bishop f4. And I think bishop f4 is much stronger than bishop d4 because on d4, the bishop is clogging the coordination of white's pieces. Now you can't bring the knight to d4. Now you don't have the d file. Here, black simply castles, plays rook f8, and we pick up the pawn. Bishop f4, I think, is the best move, practically speaking. Um, we would have castled. And probably white should go knight d4 at this point. And it occurred to me that if we play bishop d5, white can bring the rook into the game. And black experiences uh, a good amount of tactical problems here. Because if we just go after the pawn, this is a big blunder because of the move knight b5. Attacking the bishop, attacking c7, we're losing material. So you might say, well, no problem, let's just go a6. But a6 doesn't actually stop knight b5. You know, white can play a random move like a3, and rook f8 again runs into knight b5. Takes, takes, the pawn is protected. And if we play c6, the rook drives into d7. I don't think white is worse here. It's probably equal. So if we rewind, after bishop f4, um, probably it is a good idea for black to throw in the moves h6, h4. Because h4 is a slightly weakening move. We probably would have castled now. And in this position, I think the best approach for black is not to play bishop d5 but to drop the bishop to d7. And one of the benefits of inducing h4 comes out here, the fact that the bishop does have a nice little stronghold on g4. I think this endgame, if you turn on the engine, will probably show us equal, something around equal. It's dynamically balanced. Both sides have pretty good chances here. It's just complicated. Why not f6 instead of h6, asks Zaxxon. f6 is a bad move because you're helping your opponent eradicate the weakness for free. You're trading off the weakness uh, and in addition, you're blundering the pawn on c7. So the point of h6 is to play g5, dislodging the bishop from f4, and we're just trying to go after this pawn. And we're inducing a weakening move, a move that weakens the light squares even further. So, Conrad, you decided to sacrifice the pawn, which is a very interesting decision. Bishop c5, I think, is a very serious mistake. This is a myopic move. Because you're trying to prevent the black king from moving, but... You don't have the machinery to be able to do that. And after f5, it's very easy to go around this with king f7 and king e6. So I feel very strongly that bishop d4 was the best chance here for white. Let's analyze this endgame. Bishop takes d4, rook takes d4. 
Um, Martos asks another interesting question. Before we analyze this, why doesn't White play e6 and trade the e pawn for the c pawn? Okay, let's rewind. So you were asking, why doesn't White go bishop f4, h6, and e6? Interesting question. I think the explanation is going to be quite deep. e6, I think, is not a bad move. But after f takes e6, bishop takes e7, what has been the result of this trade? Yes, you have optically ruined black structure, but you have given me the f file. What can we do with the f file? Well, rook f2 is a big threat. e3 and rook f2 is a big threat. Black suddenly gets a lot of dynamic counterplay. And what's really interesting is that now if white plays knight d4, which move looks a heck of a lot better than it did without uh, white playing e6. Who can tell me where the bishop should go in this position? I remind you, after h6, h4, castles, knight d4, here we drop the bishop back to d7. But after e6, fe, we suddenly have a hidden benefit. We can play bishop d5, and the pawn on e6 defends the bishop, which means there's no tactics related to a discovered attack against the bishop. Notice how the bishop protects both of these pawns very securely, and because they're on light squares, they're going to be very, very difficult to attack one more time. So this is a good example of a line in which factors in which what you might see if you look at this for a couple of seconds is the bad pawn structure, but there's additional benefits that black gains from this trade, which might not be as evident. Is b3c4 not a problem? Um, yeah, b3 is possible, but I think concretely black is okay. Rook ac8 skewers the bishop to the pawn. Yeah, but I don't think you're actually going to be able to play b3. I don't think you're actually going to be able to play b3. Rook ac8, you're probably going to go bishop d6. But I can even, I can probably do this thing where I go rook f2, c4. Oh, and I just confirmed this with the engine. Black has a brilliant move here. Find, pause the video if you're on, watching this on YouTube and find Black's move. This shows us that you should never forget about tactics in the endgame, and you have enough pieces here to be able to deliver checkmate for Black. You break through. There's a bishop, there's a rook on the second, there's another rook on c8 that is just itching to join the action, and you join the action by crashing through the c-file. Bishop takes c4, and rook takes c4, and this is crushing for Black. And it's not such a crazy sack. You already have two pawns for the piece, but also the knight is hanging. The knight is hanging, cannot be defended. And if you move the knight, you get massacred on the second rank. This is just checkmate. This is just checkmate. Rook c2. Or, or king a1, rook takes b3 with a discovered mate. So, yeah, some high-level lines here. Uh, but you can see the black's position is quite dynamically, you know, there, there's it's full of full of energy, right? You have the capacity to meet whatever white throws at you. So knight d4, bishop e5. Let's get back to bishop d4, which would have been the best move. Trade, f5, and rook h d1. So this position is very difficult to evaluate because black is up a pawn. It's a big pawn, but white has full control of the only open file in the position, which, as I've said many times, is a pretty big deal. So here's what I was calculating here during the game. How do we meet rook d7? Well, we can't prevent white from getting to d7, so we have to try to take the sting out of it. How do we take the sting out of a rook appearing on the seventh rank? Well, normally, the prescribed method is to engineer uh, a situation where you're able to put your own rook on the seventh rank to smoke your opponent's rook out. You can do this in two ways. You can castle and then meet rook d7 with rook f7. How does the line continue? Well, white can trade one pair of rooks, and then put the other rook on the seventh rank. And here you get a crazy endgame that I think black has to be better here because yes, white is grabbing all of these pawns, but black can play the move rook d8 and cut the king off, prevent it from ever getting to d2 again. And even though at this point, black is down a pawn, look at these past pawns. You're gonna go f4 and e3 and you're just gonna easily promote the e pawn. The passers are totally deadly here. It should make sense to you that black is winning in this position. And I just confirmed to the engine. Black is winning in this position. According to the engine, in this position, this is so instructive. Who can tell me what white's best move is? It's not rook takes c7. It's not rook takes h7. What does white absolutely need to do to give himself a chance of stopping black's passers? Bring the king into d2. Patience. Black plays g5. And now you go king e3. 
You need to use your king to try to stop black from playing f4. Unfortunately for white, it looks like black is still winning here. Rook e8 is the computer move. And if rook takes c7, black wins with a very pretty tactic. f4, take, 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 e3. And amazingly, the pawn is unstoppable. You're at this point up a million pawns, but the king just hides away on h8. And you're just going to go e2 and e1. White is not in time. Again, rook behind pass pawn. So my guess is that white probably has some way to hold the draw here. But if we were to reason in practical terms, the decisive mistake, I think, actually is giving up the c5 pawn. Giving black the four on two pawn majority on the king side just makes it so difficult for white to defend because it's such a simple idea. F5, G5, and F4. You're just pushing your pawns like a monkey. So... Bishop c5, I think, exacerbates the situation after f5. I think that black is almost already winning. King b1, Conrad, I really didn't understand. I think this, this is just a waste of a move. I mean, if I were you, I would at least maybe try to bring the rook into the game and, and you know, try to make it di more difficult for black to, uh, to do what he wants to do. I also was a little bit worried about rook d2. Here... If black plays a6, you are able to double rooks in time to prevent rook d8. So after rook d2, we would have played king f7. Now maybe you can try rook d7 check. You can try to muddy the waters, right? Of course you're losing, but maybe going something like this. Yeah, now you at least have a rook on the seventh and both of the pairs of the rooks are on the board. You can try to make things a little bit more complicated here. You were worried about me getting the bishop to f4 with the win, but f4 is defended. I don't really understand in which situation you were concerned about it. F4 is defended by the pawn. If you were saying you were worried about me playing F4, I get that, but now look at these pawns. They're incredibly weak. White has rook to E1. Again, you need to look for tactics, even with the queens off the board. Notice the alignment of the bishop and the king. What does that alignment tell, tell us? It tells us that if the E pawn disappears from the board, black is going to lose the bishop. So after e3, there is bishop takes e3, f e3, rook e3, and the table's turn because the bishop cannot be protected. So that's why I made the point about preparing the move f4 before playing it. Pawns don't move backwards. That's why it's a given that black has to advance the king to the center before even considering pushing these pawns. So one piece of advice is that when you're on the losing side of a position like this, you can no longer afford the kinds of niceties that you can afford when you're better or when the position is equal you can no longer afford uh to to you know make prophylactic moves you need to get on with business and you know obviously you're not going to like the look of anything but king b1 every tempo is precious when you're losing because every tempo with every tempo that you're not creating problems for your opponent you're giving your opponent a chance to consolidate does that make sense so after king b1, when I look at this move, when I play a6, the game is over. Because now I get the rook to d8. You can't really avoid a rook trade. Once the rooks are traded, we just get our king to e6. Um, just to reiterate that after rook d7 check, which I would have played with white, we do not go king e6. That loses rook e7, king d5, and rook takes e5. These types of tricks are no brainers. You want to set these types of traps if you're on the defending side here. Because it's not that obvious. A lot of people forget to look for tactics in the end game. I think bishop e3 is a little bit too passive. After h6, here we can basically stop our analysis because f4 is coming and it's inevitable. Maybe the last chance for white was to go rook d7, king f6. And now try to bring the king into the game with king c1. Of course, g5, king d2, f4 is miserable. But... White can try at least to force black to work here. A lot of people, I think, would go f3. And f3, I think, already is inaccurate because now suddenly these pawns are weak. If you're black here, you want to be very patient. You want to play a move like h5. And the funny thing is, if white pushes a pawn on the king side, a queen side, you can actually now play fg3, hg3, and bishop g3, creating a different set of connected passers. These ones are even more dangerous than enf because they're further away from white's king. So, but still, this would have given white some practical chances. Bishop e3, h6, and g5, and the rest of the game is very straightforward. We just play f4, and we trade and go e3, and we can stop here. 
Any questions about this analysis? A, a simple, straightforward game, which was made easier by the fact that, Conrad, you, you found a very interesting idea with the pawn sack, but practically speaking, to give up this pawn is too big of an investment given what you get in return. So it would have been, you know, much, much more challenging to defend the pawn with bishop f4. It shows us that chess is often about understanding the balance, the balance between uh, material and piece activity. And there's no clear, you know, the balance sways in a different direction based on certain factors. The prevailing factor here was, the, was how easy it was for black to create connected passers once the pawn disappears from e5. If we rearrange the pawn structure such that if we just included the moves h5, h4, if we had these moves already included and we do exactly the same thing, all right, we imagine that basically the same position occurs on the board. Already here, after bishop d4, I think white is not worse. I think white is not, or not much worse, because it is virtually impossible for black to create connected passers. So that small of a change makes a huge difference in the evaluation. And weighing these factors, detecting them, is a product of experience and analyzing games and understanding when you overestimate factors and underestimate other factors. In any case, that's where we're going to end for today, guys. Hope you enjoyed the game. With white, next game, we're going to insist on getting something a little bit more tactical. And uh, I'll see you guys later. Thanks for hanging out today. Hope you enjoyed the stream. Bye.